Now for this session, I want to talk about an old device, an old soda machine, a vending machine that I used to see when I was a little kid growing up. Now, some of you may be about my age will remember this. Some who are younger might not, but here's how the thing worked. It was a soda machine, usually outside, with a long vertical glass door, and you would open the glass door and you could actually get your hand on the tips of the bottles of the soda machine. It's a weird kind of concept where there was a metal enclosure and when you put the money in, the metal enclosure would open and you could pull the bottle of Coke or Pepsi out. It was an old design kind of circa 1970s into the 1980s. Well, here's what I learned as a young kid, not realizing that eventually I'd get into sort of a life of hacking and cybersecurity. But we figured out that because you could reach the tip of the bottle, that if you took a bottle opener and a straw and put it inside the bottle, you could drink all the soda out. And as little kids, we would walk around and hit these machines constantly. And it's kind of an easy thing to explain to do. Like I've told you now, if you ever saw a machine like that, you'd know immediately how to hit it. Now, here's the problem. The problem is, if I asked you to solve that problem, what would you do? Think about it a minute. What would you do to stop a problem like that? Now, some people say, well, I'd redesign the machine. And that's correct. You did redesign a machine. You probably can't find machines like that today anywhere. But what if I told you you want to fix the thing now? Suppose it's in front of one of your stores and kids are hitting this. What would you do? Well, there's a lot of different options, but none of them are great. Like you might, for example, put a little note that you tape on the machine and you'd say, hey, all you kids, stop taking a bottle opener and a straw and drinking out all the soda. If you did that, you'd tell the kids what's going on. There'd be a terrible note to put on the machine. But if you try and dumb it down, if you said, hey, all you kids, that thing you're doing, and you know what I mean, that thing, stop doing that thing that you're doing, because, I mean, that's ridiculous, and it's like a, a, a silly thing. In cybersecurity, we call that an advisory. And in our industry, it's hard to write advisories. But at any rate, note is one thing. A lot of people think maybe putting a camera and watching the kids with that. And yeah, maybe that works. You better make sure it's a, a real camera because if it's up in the corner and it's kind of fake, a kid's gonna know that. And if it's real, well then what? Do you actually have to hook it up to something and review the tape? And keep in mind, a bottle of Coke is maybe 25 cents in the, in the 70s. So do you really wanna spend $1,000 on a surveillance camera and all? It's crazy. There's a lot of other possibilities. Move the machine in your store, but then your revenue goes down. The point is that the more you think about this, the more you realize that it's a simple hack, but the solution is not simple. And that's something you're going to see over and over and over again as a theme as we go through our lectures. You're gonna see that there may be problems that seem straightforward. For example, Alice and Bob, they wanna communicate. Alice would like to, provide an identity to Bob, and then prove that it's really her identity. See, it sounds like a pretty simple thing, right? Well, where do you see the kinds of fuss that we need to go to with protocols to actually make that work? In some circles, that's called robustness. It's called a, a system that has a little problem with a, only a little solution necessary is robust if, as the problem grows, the solution grows. So that's a robust system when those two dependencies are, are proportional. But when they're not, when you have a situation where a little problem needs a big solution or the reverse, then we say that the system is not necessarily very robust. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go through our sessions and ponder in your own mind, you know, what are situations you might know from your own life where a little problem begs a, a, a big solution? Those are tough when that comes up. So We'll use that as a way of sort of getting us in the mood to learn some about different types of hacks and different types of solutions that reduce the risk of those hacks. So give that some thought. Hello everyone. So for this session, we're going to talk about something called a worm program. And I think you know what a worm is. Now here's the idea. You may or may not be somewhat familiar with the idea of a virus. That's a piece of malware that gets on a system that 
looks to be doing one thing, but it actually does something different. Well, we've learned over time that that concept can be lethal if in fact it can propagate on its own. What that means is if I put a little piece of malware on a, com on a computer and then I push a button, make it run, and it finds its way across a network, that's a frightening concept because it's cascading, it's propagating without human beings having to do something. And we call that kind of program a worm. Now, turns out that there's three steps in a worm program. And if you're a programmer, then you might even say three lines of code. But think of it as three steps. The first step in a worm program is that the program itself, running on a computer, needs to find another computer it can connect to. In the old days, you'd look it up in a Unix file. Nowadays, you might create a TCP IP address, number, dot, number, dot, number, dot, number, and use that as some way of sort of pointing off to find another computer. So that's step one, find a place you can copy to. Step two in the worm is to actually take the worm program and copy it to that other machine. There's a lot of ways you can do that. You can do that with browsers. You can do it with different types of runtime environments. And frankly, you can do it by exploiting bugs in software that allow you to copy executables onto another machine. So that's the second step. And the third step is to actually run the program then on that machine. And think about it, what's going to happen? When I run it on that new machine, what's it going to do? It's then going to find a computer that it can connect to, again, IP address or whatever. It's going to then copy itself and then it's going to run that, in which case, what's it going to do? It's going to find a machine, copy itself, run, find a machine. Get the idea? It's going to cascade. Now, the first time we saw something like this was back in 1988. That's before a lot of you were born. It's a young man in New Jersey, you know, where I live in the United States, who wrote a program that did essentially this. Um, his name was Robert Morris. Junior, Robert Morris Sr., his father was actually my boss at the time uh, at at t Bell Laboratories. But he wrote this program and he pushed it on the internet somewhat inadvertently and it created a gigantic debate, an early debate, about whether he was to be held responsible for this. I think it's sort of an important lesson. This was a young man, he was a graduate student, he had no intention of causing problems. And yet he brought the internet down with that simple worm program. We call it, appropriately enough, the worm program of 1988, the, Mar or the Mars worm. So if you look that up, if you look on the internet, look up Mars worm, you'll see a little bit of information. Bottom line is that a worm program is those three lines. Now, for your further consideration, as you think about this session and think about the discussion we're having here, I'd like you to think a little bit about where you might actually inject some lines of code, some functionality, some additional steps to do a little bit of damage at each machine that you visit. For example, when the worm program visits a machine, copies itself, maybe before it executes, perhaps it could do something. Check for passwords, look around, see if there's something interesting. I'd like you to ponder that. Think through what types of activities you might add to a worm program to actually make it somewhat more lethal or at least more interesting to the attacker. So, so what you should take from this is worm program is very simple, three steps. But as we've said in other discussions, for example, you remember our old soda machine example. Worm program is easy to describe, not so easy to stop. Once something like this is coded, this is not necessarily the easiest thing in the world to stop. So with that, I'd like you to ponder a little bit about worms, and we'll be back with another session. Hi, for this session, I want to talk to you about a piece of software called a Trojan horse. Now, I've alluded to this before. Trojan horse is something that looks like one thing, but is actually something different. So imagine you download something to your mobile app and you think it's a game that maybe you're playing, not realizing that that game that you're playing is also maybe sending your contacts out to somebody. So you get the idea? It's something that looks like one thing, but is actually another. Now, a classic type of program like that has a function called a trapdoor. So here's the idea. I'm pretty sure everybody watching has logged into something, logged into an online system, logged into a computer, logged into a network. You'll get some request for who you are. 
what's your user ID, your name, your account, something like that, and you type it in. And then the second step is usually, well, what is your password or PIN? There might be other ways, but for now, let's assume it's a password. So you type your user ID, type password, and then some piece of software is looking at what you typed in as your name, and then looking at what you typed in as your password, and checking them. It knows ahead of time in some table, some database, some data structure that you've prearranged. You've gone some, through some infrastructure steps, some administrative steps with the owner of that program to connect your name and your password. You've all done that. Now, think about the code that implements something like that. There's going to be a piece of software that'll have a line in it that'll be something like get user ID, get, get your name, ingest it, and understand, recognize your name. Again, this is not a big deal for anybody who's ever looked at even a piece of software. The second thing is there'll be a little piece of code that's gonna say, get your password. You type it in, it's gonna get it, and then it'll compare the two. So we would say that the policy for such a system is, if your user ID and password combination is valid, you're in. That's it, that's the policy. That's what you would write in the user, user's guide. Now suppose, a programmer decides, I'm going to put a Trojan horse trap door into this code. So what they would then do is they'd introduce something called a conditional. If you're a programmer, you know what I'm talking about. It's an, an or, essentially, in the, in the test logic of something. So what I would have is something essentially that would say, if your password and user ID are valid, then you're in, or in the code, if you just know the secret password is one, two, three, ABC, then you're in. Now think about that. That's in the code. It's compiled, it's built, and there's the code. And you log into the system and the policy, the user manual says, you have to have a valid user ID and password combination. Not telling you that, oh, and also, if you know the secret password, you can get in. That's a trap door. And it's a Trojan horse because you don't know that functionality is there. Just like when you download it to your mobile app, that piece of software that you thought was a game, but it's actually doing something else, mailing your address book out or something. In both cases, you're being tricked. You don't realize it. You don't realize what's in there. Now, how do you stop something like this? What do you do? Possibly stop that. I mean, if you're downloading a piece of software, do you have any idea what's in there? Do you, do you, do you, when you buy it, you get the code with it? No, of course you don't. I mean, I, I understand that there's certainly some open source utilities that do, but the vast majority of software, 99% of the kind of software that our learning community would be using day in and day out, you have no idea what's in there. You bought it, you downloaded it, you run, and that's it. And what's the key word? You trust the developer to not put those types of things in there. That's a tough sort of issue. How much can you trust the developer? How reasonable is it for you to trust the developer? Look, if it's Microsoft or Apple or a kind of a, a, a developer that has some, some reputation and has some consequence if they did do something like that, um, then you can generally trust them. Certainly, in my opinion, it's your decision whether you trust them, but I would certainly recommend that that's a good decision. But if it's a developer you don't know, you see something on a mobile app store that looks kind of cool, you download it, you don't know who the developer is, should you be trusting that? I guess that's an open question. That's something that, for someone like me doing cybersecurity, I would tend to say don't. Uh, you'll have to make that decision on your own. Now, to help in your learning process here, Let's take a little quiz here. Let's uh, think through some of the possible ways that we might actually stop or reduce the risk of a Trojan horse trap door, you know, with along the lines of what we talked about where you put a little secret password in there. What are some ways that we might be able to stop that? So we have three options I want you to think through. Option A would be to do some testing on the software where you're testing the code, typing in a lot of different options checks with whatever you run through some guesses that'd be it b would be doing some code review where you're looking at the actual code you have to have access to the code to do that but would that be maybe more effective and then c would be getting some understanding of the software process 
that went into building it. Now think about that for a minute. Which of those three in your mind is more likely to pick up a Trojan horse trap door? I think when you think about it for a moment, you'll realize we'll go through each one now. Program testing, good luck. Like unless you have spectacular good luck and you happen to type in the secret password, you're never going to pick that up with testing. So program testing, terrible way to pick up something like that. Let's skip to C, process compliance, where you're kind of looking at how the development process worked. That might help. Like I'd like to know whether it's chaotic or structured. So I think there's something there. That may not be too bad, but obviously the right answer here is to look at the code. Like if I can actually review the code, I can look to see whether you've coded in certain types of trap doors. Now, the ways this can be subverted itself, we're going to talk about that in a subsequent discussion, but I hope you'll continue to give some consideration to the issue of trust in software and the problems that arise when Trojan horses are downloaded to our computers. Thanks. You know, before we get into this session, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. So I kind of grew up in Bell Laboratories. It was this wonderful technology environment that I think was about the most incredible place to learn computing, networking, software. It was kind of in the 60s, 70s, 80s that that group, that Bell Laboratories group, was writing some software. And one of the products that came out of it was something we know as Unix, which is the base technology for most of the things that run on your phone. Certainly iOS and Android are Unix derivatives, as is Linux. And I think even if you lift the hood up on Windows, you'll find that in the kernel, there's something called a POSIX compliant piece of software, which is also Unix. So you could argue that just about everything you run on all your computers emanated from Bell Labs. The reason I bring this up is because around that time, there were a couple of geniuses there, two guys who built Unix, one of whom, Ken Thompson, won an award, a Turing Award, which you should know is the computer science equivalent of, say, the Nobel Prize. He won this Turing Award for Unix. And when he gave his speech, he talked about Trojan horses and how, in some sense, you can make them invisible to code review. Now, you might remember in a, in a previous session, we talked about how if we were looking for a Trojan horse that was inserted in, say, a login program where you're checking login password. Just look in the code and there it is. But here's what Ken Thompson reminded us. Let me give you a little bit of background. I think you guys know that when you write a piece of software, you put it in a translator, right? It might be a compiler, it might be an assembler. Some of you, I'm sure, are programmers, so you know that you write your code, it gets translated into something that can then be executed. And I understand there's linking and loading, but to make things simple, program, translator, object code. Make sense? So what Ken Thompson said was, take this source code that has, you know, maybe it's clean. There's no Trojan horse embedded in it. I run it through a good compiler. I'm going to get clean object code, clean source, clean compiler, clean object. Everything's good. But if, as we learned previously, let's say I put Trojan horse stuff in the source code. I put a little check with a secret trapdoor password, dirty source, through a clean compiler, produce a dirty object. Got it? I write the Trojan horse, translate it, it's in the code. Well, we said earlier, eh, you find something like that? Well, go look at the code, see what's in there. I'm gonna have a little piece of software that says, if password user ID valid, or password equals ABC one through three, then let you know, I have that in there, I'd see it in a code review. Here's the genius that Ken Thompson came up with. He said, you know what, instead of putting it there, why don't you have the compiler just insert that? Do you follow? The compiler's translating, so it sees clean source code, and when it's translating it, it translates the clean, but also inserts the dirty part. Isn't that, isn't that something? I mean, here's the implication of something like this. If Previously, you thought, well, I can always just look at source code and see if it has Trojan horses. And we all acknowledge that, yeah, I mean, 99% of the code we run, the programs we run, the things you download to your, your phone, you're not looking at the source code. But if you could, you could probably 
sense that there was something weird if you see these funny password checkers that are in there. But if I do it in the compiler, the chances of you ever having the opportunity to go in and review the code in a translator, very, very, very low. Now let's think about this. It implies something that as computer scientists, as engineers, as business people, as students, that we must understand. And it's profound. Here's what Ken Thompson said. I want you to think. He said, you can't trust any piece of software that you didn't completely write yourself, including all the translation tools around it. What the corollary there is you can't trust software. This is a depressing fact in computer science now. If you've never heard that, then I hope you're sitting down. You know, I mean, that's a, a pretty jarring concept that we can't trust software. And in some sense, it helps to explain this crazy cybersecurity industry that we're going to be learning about in our sessions. You think, why am I watching software to see what it does? Why do I have to build scaffolding around systems? Why can't I just fix it in the first place? The reason is because we can't trust software. That's the reason. It's, a, it, it's probably the one root cause for almost every hack we've ever seen. That software, it turns out, is remarkably difficult to get correct. You know, it, you, you build a building, and the building should be a structure that stands. You don't build systems around a building to catch it when it falls over. That would be ridiculous. You would say, are you kidding me? And yet, for software, we build software, we put it in place, and then we build cybersecurity around it to stop it or catch it when it goes awry. This is a fundamental notion, this question of trust and systems. I want you to keep that in mind as we go through the sessions. Now, just to kind of check on our learning here around this problem of translators, let's do what we do. Let's think about how you might stop something like this. You remember, previous session we talked about soda machines. I asked you to think about how you'd fix it. We taped the note, we put a camera, we tried all this stuff, none of it worked too well. We also, when we were talking about our simple login program, I said, how would you find the problem here? We came to the conclusion that code review might be the best way to do it. Well, now I would ask you as a little quiz, how might we reduce the risk of a Trojan horse in a compiler? Let's go through the three options. So first option might be to test the compiler, right? So that so test it, run through a bunch of tests. Second possibility would be to impose stiff contracts or legal contractual requirements on the compiler vendor that we're buying the thing from. And the third might be to interview lots of different compiler vendors when we're buying our translator. So we've got testing, we've got contracts, we've got multiple vendors. Now think about that. Which of those in your mind do you think would potentially reduce the risk of there being an insertion in your translator? I think what you'll find when you think about it, testing will have the same problem we had before. Too many possibilities, very unlikely that you'll ever pick something up in testing. So that doesn't work. Let's skip to our third one, this issue of multiple compiler vendors. Well, maybe it would be a good idea to talk to a few different vendors, maybe reduces the probability, maybe. But I think the correct answer here is, interestingly enough, B. That means contractually, you should ask your software provider to sign something saying it's nothing like that in the code. Make it legal. If they're going to put that in, at least force them to lie on a contract. They're be a little bit tough for them to want to do that. So it's a weird sort of thing where a computer scientist, a software engineer, a manager would have to resort to essentially making the software vendor raise their hand and swear they didn't put the thing in there. And you do that with a contract. I think it's kind of funny because usually we like to fix security problems with functionality, and here I'm fixing it with a contract. So, well, I hope you learned something with this, and I'll see you in the next session. One of the main goals of a hacker is to break a system. Now, the most popular system we know is Unix, the base of Linux, iOS, Android, and so on. So when I say Unix, I'm saying it in a generic sense, in and around those, that family of systems. I want to tell you about 
an attack that sort of worked in the 90s um, as a way of kind of getting access to the kernel, to the underlying system of Unix. This is going to be a little tricky for you to follow. I'm going to take it through in, in stages. And we've got some material. You can look at the charts and they might help you a little bit. But I want you to try and follow as I take you through this attack. Now, here's the key. This attack involves features that seem fine on their own, but when you combine them, it causes a problem. Now, let's take the first one. In Unix, you're doing something called CLI, or Command Line Interface, where you're typing commands. Instead of pointing and clicking, you're typing, which means you're typing letters, spaces, arguments, spaces, and so on. Those spaces are called white space, and they separate a command from its argument. Like if you were typing add space x space plus space y, the spaces separate the different fields in the command line interface. That makes sense? So in Unix, weirdly enough, in addition to just a space and say a tab, that, that's what you would guess, you can put anything you want in there. Now in Unix, there's a thing called a path name where you have a slash character, a word, a slash character, a word, and so on. And the first slash we call in Unix root. Now, Here's the first piece of the attack. Take the slash and define that also as a white space. It's a simple command in Unix. It's called the internal field separator. It's a variable. You just say that internal field separator is both space, tab, and slash. Got it? That's stage one. Easy to understand. You could say, why would you want to do that? Unix designers were weird. They just like to give you the option of having weird command line interface. Now, the second feature that we're going to use in the attack is something called set UID to root. Now, this is a feature in Unix that allows a program running with low privilege to suddenly jump up to get high privilege to do something and then drop back down to low. So, for example, if we're on a shared system and I said, can you touch the password file and you're a normal user? You'd say, no, I can't change the password file. But if I said, can you change your password? You'd go, Yes, I can change mine. I have a command. I can change my own password. I'd say, great. Then what that means is you're going to invoke a password program as a normal user. It's going to run when it has to go change the password file, set UID to root, change the password file with high privilege, and then execute. Got that? So set UID allows a program to increase its privilege. Now, the third feature of Unix is that it's open source. That means you can read the code. Go and read what's going on. So go find some program that runs set UID to root and find some piece of code that runs at high privilege. So for example, if there's a piece of code that runs with high privilege in a set UID program that does exec space slash file slash something like a path name, then notice that that's there. That's the third stage. Just write it down. See what that piece of code is. Now, a fourth piece of this is that in the Unix shell, you can put commands in and run it as a program. So I can create a program called steel shell and put commands in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little program in, put it in my home directory that's going to copy the Unix shell to some other name. Now you should know that in Unix, the shell is my view of the operating system. It's SH, it's the name of the command, name of the program. So I'm gonna copy my view of SH to some other name, call it hack shell. Now let's go through this. First thing I do, make IFS include slash, got it? Next thing, I have in my home directory that program that copies the shell to some other name. Now third, I run the set UID program. Now what's going to happen? It runs, increases privilege, does the exact space slash, and then there's a name. Let's say that's called bin. You know that program that's in my home directory? Call that bin. And now what will happen is it's going to execute bin with high privilege, and it'll copy the shell to you. Is that crazy? Let me go through that one more time with you, because it's amazing how they all come together. I put a program in my home directory called bin. That program copies the shell to a hack shell. I change the field separator to basically dissolve the slash character. It looks like a space now. 
I run a set UID program, it increases the high privilege, it execs but ignores the slash, runs something that says bin, thinking that's part of a path, I've dissolved all the, all the path separators, and it's gonna copy a shell to me. Now that's tricky, listen, it's not important for quizzes or anything for you to memorize those steps. If you didn't understand that, I don't want you to freak out. Most people have a little trouble with that, but I wanted you to see that this can get a little complicated, that hacking is not simple, but when I explain it to you, it's totally simple. You got it? You need somebody who can really dig into the internals and create a hack, but once it's created, once it's automated, I could write the program I just told you and mail it to you and you run it. And now you're a hacker, you didn't have to do the design. But I wanted you to see something that was a little bit more involved. If you're interested, it's very easy on the internet to go off and find different types of resources, different types of information around hacking. Be very careful with that though. I don't want any of you downloading hacking tools and actually doing this sort of thing to real networks, but it's certainly worth taking some time to go review. And as part of the work here, we'll make sure that you see some good, solid resources on all of these different things that will help you in your personal learning plan. So thanks. You know, as a learning community, we're going to be spending so much time on technology and on architecture and on security concepts that we wanted to balance that with some practical discussions with people I think you're going to enjoy hearing from. We'll mix in some CEO founder types of security companies so you can hear from them and also some practitioners. What you're going to find is sometimes they'll use jargon or terminology that may or may not match what we talk about during our lectures, but it'll be a good balance for you and I think you're really going to enjoy it. So as we go through the series, listen to our guests, see what you can absorb about them. And in some cases, you can do some research on them on the internet, learn a little bit more about them. So I hope you enjoy our interview series. We're, we're doing it to try to provide some nice balance. Well, welcome, Lou Manusos, the founder and CEO of Risk IQ. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. That's great. Thanks for coming. Hey, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm, as you said, the founder and CEO of Risk IQ. I, I have a background in technology, uh, grew up in the Midwest. I've been using computers and thinking about security from the young age of seven years old. Mm -hmm. uh, I always fascinated with the internet and how that could sort of change things. One of the things that sort of drew me into uh, cybersecurity was I, I originally went to university for a degree in physics. Mm. and. While I worked in the university, a professor came by, one of my professors on rollerblades, and he said, hey, uh, you're this odd physics student that knows a little bit about Linux. And uh, in security, we have this pro program over at Argonne National Labs, and we need, we need somebody like you who knows physics, who can work in the lab, but also can help us, because that's where, the, where we're going in physics, is to uh, embrace the internet and, and computing. So uh, that's actually how I got into uh, security was trying to secure servers and make the world of physics more secure. Did you find that some of the thinking that you did studying physics kind of leads well into computer yeah, science? Yeah, so, so the thing that I find really interesting about physics is the same reason I like cybersecurity, and that's that cybersecurity is a, is, is a, a game theory. It's a larger discipline with adversaries and it's also a problem that's very difficult to solve if, if not impossible because it's a game between you know, the bad guys and the good guys and you know physics every time you get one step further to the the answer the answer just keeps getting further yeah. away so so there was a lot of similarities uh, that I saw working in physics and what I still see today every day there's a new threat there's a new Thing to learn, uh, whether it's on the business side of things or on the actual technology. That's great. Mm -hmm. Now, tell us about founding a cybersecurity company. What what prompted you to do that? And mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about what it takes to do something like that. So, I, I think uh, there's really three things that uh, embody the culture of 
of a company, and this is something that I talk to our employees about. Uh, one is that you have to have you know passionate curiosity in solving a real problem for a customer. And you know, customers in this case, it's really everybody. We use the internet, and there's threats. There's bad guys that want to break the system. So uh, having that tendency to chase uh, the rabbit down the hole mm. and really have an interest in solving uh, a, a problem for a customer and then continuing to innovate, uh, that's, that's very, very important. I think uh, many companies don't uh, take the perspective of the customer. They think about trying to solve some problem without mm. knowing how it maps to a business use case. And what you'll find as a, a startup founder that's successful is that your customers will guide you towards the truth. So, so that's something that I, I look for uh, all the time. And when I hire people, when I think about my partners in the business, you know, do they have that type of orientation? Oh, but it goes back to the curiosity. If it's, you don't wake up in the morning and worry about you know, the problem, you know, you're not, you're not going to do a good job at it. So you got to really love, love the business that you're in. Yeah. So you said customer over and over and over. Is that really the key? Like focus on customer, do you think? Well, you know, you got to get your hands dirty is what I say. And, and that means living in as the target. So if you're in cybersecurity, you think that's a career for you. Uh, the only way to know what it's like to be a victim is to work with the people who are actually targeted. <laughs> and so uh, that's what I mean when I say customer. So, and I, I like to solve problems by uh, witnessing the actual event myself. And so the, you know, the curiosity gets you there, but then once you're there, you have to live in their shoes. So that's mm. really why I think that's so important. And, and a ton of people get it wrong. And uh, what you'll need is, is money to start your company. Right. And the only way you're going to get funded is if you've got use cases from real buyers. So why not bring those buyers in earlier is the way that I always look at it. I think people get that backwards. Often mm. they go think about raising money first without uh, really understanding the use case. So you think if someone has passion and persistence and willingness to innovate, combine that kind of with uh, customer focus, ability to raise a little money, are those the ingredients to being a successful entrepreneur? I think, uh, yeah, the people and those finding other people who also believe in those qualities uh, tend to build the right team. And if you miss that team and you, you get the wrong partners, if you can do it all yourself, great, but that's rarely the case. So it's not only having those qualities in yourself, but being able to select others who can, mm. can go on that journey with you. Uh, it's not a uh, it's not just an end state, you know, starting a business, you've got to like the journey. So that's the other part of it is if you're, if you're really passionate about solving this problem, every day is a, another day of that journey. And, and you want to make sure those people who are sitting next to you in the chair are, are people you want to sit next to. That's great. Well, Lou, thanks so much for sharing with our learning community. It was wonderful talking to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So we're back with my friend Lou Manusos, founder and CEO of cybersecurity firm Risk IQ. So we learned a little bit about you in a previous video. Now I want to learn about your technology. Tell us what you guys do and kind of how it helps uh, reduce cyber risk. So Risk IQ is is different from the other cybersecurity companies in that we look at the threats uh, as they originate out on the internet. So. Most cybersecurity companies have a technology that sits on a firewall or on an endpoint. At Risk IQ, we look at the entire internet and we collect data and analyze that data as the attacks are forming. And we empower investigators, uh, which are hunting threats, mm. uh, and defenders who are helping to defend against internet attacks. And we give them the tools that they need to respond faster, uh, take their tier one guys and make them more efficient at what they're doing and give you a full picture of the attack surface in the same way the attacker would see it. Mm. Now, when you say look out over the internet, are those people? Is it technology you're using? Is it a combination? How do you do that? So Risk IQ is a product that comes with internet data. So we give our customers the tooling that they need to take the outside view of the internet and bring that into their environment. So it's an analytics capability with a user interface that brings in 
literally petabytes of internet data mm -hmm. and makes that accessible to any analyst on the security team. What are they looking for? Are they looking for signatures of attack? Are they looking for credit cards for sale? Are they looking for brand being abused? What, what do they find when they look? Well, what normally happens is one of two things. Either uh, they have an incident mm -hmm. and there's a ticket that's been created or uh, some threat intelligence, an indicator that the company is uh, trying to learn more about it. So because most threats begin out on the internet, they have an IP address and a domain name that's associated with that indicator. Our platform will provide visibility into where that domain name uh, resolved. So that's mm -hmm. the IP address related to the domain name. What other domain names are connected to that particular uh, domain? Uh, what other traffic might have come from that particular attack? So it's that sort of thing. What do you do then? Like when you find, let's say I find some domain hanky-panky going on and I say, oh my gosh, I got a big problem. Do I call law enforcement? Do I change some settings on my firewall? What, what, what do I do? So most companies are either, they're responding to a threat. So there might be a breach that's already occurred. And so they're trying to learn more about that attacker. Is that attacker maintaining access to our network through other command and control? So what our platform provides is visibility into what we call a digital footprint that's either related to the company or to the attacker. So as the attacker moves through the network, uh, they're leaving trails out on the internet how they're accessing the network and we provide the defenders in, that, in this instance an ability to find out all these other ways that they got into the network. So the, the output is a, blo a better blocking inside their firewall. Uh, in the case of, let's say, a spear phishing attack, we will help the defenders take that infrastructure offline, which may be communicating with an ISP, it might be actually working with the registrar to get that domain name shut down. And that once the domain name is down, then that threat infrastructure cannot be used by the attacker. Hey, are you optimistic that security companies and security teams can maybe catch up to the offense a little bit. You think we'll ever get to that point? Well, it's a, it's a cat and a mouse game. And as I said earlier, I, what I like about security is it, it is a game, it's not a problem. So mm. we, uh, as security professionals, need to recognize that uh, you're always going to be responding in some way. So any program has to have response as part of what you're doing. So be proactive, but at the same time, you know there will be new exploits, there will be vulnerabilities that your team missed. So I think you need to plan uh, to to respond. And that that's un, un, the unfortunate facts of the game theory that we live in. Interesting. Well, Lou, on behalf of our learning community, I want to thank you for joining us. And uh, I hope you had fun chatting. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Hi everyone, I'm Ed Amaros and I want to welcome you to this module. Our goal here is to kind of introduce some basic threat modeling with some examples. I think you'll enjoy it. it. kind of takes the real simple basic threat issues and gives you a little bit of um, flesh on them so you can learn a little bit about it. Now there's some papers and books and videos I'd like you to kind of follow along with as you go through the module. Um, one paper is written by a, an academic, his name is Ross Anderson. I think it's a really good paper. It's an older paper called Why Crypto Systems Fail. Um, it, it kind of takes you through some of the problems that have existed with crypto systems. I think it'll be a good background for what you're doing. A second paper is by an old colleague of mine, his name is Steve Bellavin. Again, an older paper, it's called There Be Dragons and it talks to some of the early problems that we saw on the internet with security. i like you to read some of the older papers because it provides perspective on maybe the daily social media stuff that you read about uh, on, a, uh, you know, on an hourly basis nowadays about cybersecurity. Now, there's a couple of optional books. One is an e-book. It's written by myself and my son, Matt. Uh, it's called From CIA to APT, An Introduction to Cybersecurity. I'd like you to read chapters three and four from that ebook, which you can get at Amazon. Again, it's optional, but it's sort of a companion book to the course. And for those of you who like to have something, it, it gives you an optional means for reading along with the module. 
Um, and also, I think it's important that you have a good TCP IP book. Richard Stevens has written one of the best. Uh, again, it's optional, particularly uh, if your background is a little weak in TCP IP. Then read chapters three and four from Stevens' textbook, which again, I think should be on your uh, professional technical bookshelf. There's a couple of cool videos that I think you're going to enjoy. One is from my friend Pat Peterson, who works um, at a company called Agari. There's a whiteboard session on a, a standard called DMARC. I want you to watch it. It's a little bit about some of the threats we have in the internet now, but also will telegraph some security solutions that you may find useful um, you know, in protecting emails. Take a look at it. It's kind of a good video. He stands in front of a whiteboard, and I, I think it's excellent. And then there's a DEF CON video, DEF CON 18, uh, Pawn by Owner. Take a look. We've got the uh, description of the, of the course and there, there for you to take a look at. It's about what happens when you steal a hacker's computer. I think you'll enjoy the video, and it'll complement some of the things we do in this module. So I hope very much that you enjoy the material we take you through in this module. Thanks. You know, I want to take some time here to get a little philosophical and talk about the purpose of cybersecurity. Like, what's it all about? And that, it's an important thing for you as you're learning this topic to think through yourself. Because what will happen is you spend weeks and weeks and weeks learning about cybersecurity. And then your friend, your mom, your cousin, your spouse, a coworker says, hey, what is cybersecurity all about? And you say, you know, I'm not really sure. I have all this information in my head, but I don't really have a good solid understanding. So what we're going to do is take a minute here and make sure that we're all in agreement around what this boils down to. Now, years ago in the 1970s, there was a man, James Anderson was his name, a pioneer in cybersecurity. And he was pondering this question as computers were becoming more powerful. The question was, what is, we called it at the time, computer security. We call it cybersecurity now. Here's what he came up with. He came up with something he called the reference monitor concept. And think of reference monitor as a box. And on one side of the box, you have active entities, users, hackers, processes, things doing stuff. And on the other side of the box, you have resources or assets, files, databases, systems, things you want access to. So this is like a repository. This is an active process. And you drop this thing in the middle called a reference monitor. And here's what Jim Anderson said, and I still think it's a wonderful way of thinking about cybersecurity, albeit a little operationally. But what he said was the main purpose is that as active entities try to reach passive repositories, cybersecurity sits in the middle. And when those requests come in for access to a resource, cybersecurity says, Yes or no, <laughs> it's not the most technical concept in the world, but he said, based on policy, the idea is to either allow or disallow access to a resource. Isn't that interesting? From that, a whole body of cybersecurity modeling and technology kind of emerged where we formalized terms here. We started to call these things, these active entities, subjects. And we started calling these more passive entities objects. And we called that the subject object model of cybersecurity or of computer security. And really stood for a long period of time. Now, a lot of you would say, well, wait a minute. What if there's two entities, they're both subjects and they want to communicate, send each other email and stuff? You're absolutely correct. Like the model in some sense doesn't fit all possibilities. But the bottom line is that you've got an active entity wanting to do something and a piece of cybersecurity that is saying yes or no. What this has caused in our industry is the observation amongst many people, a lot of you who are here listening, part of our learning community, will say, you know what? It's always those cybersecurity people saying no. Like maybe you have a job somewhere and you, you get this idea that when you work in the security department, you have to go ask and they usually say no. And that comes from that original concept that cybersecurity is this thing where I make an access, the reference monitor, the cybersecurity says, oh, who are you? Okay, you're allowed, I let you through. Or I say, oh, who are you? I'm sorry, you're not allowed, and I say no. That concept, I think, increasingly has given way to, I think, a much more collegial notion of cybersecurity, and that's security as an enabler. And what that means is 
that under normal circumstances, you might be very nervous about whether subjects can or should be accessing objects. For example, subject with credit card wants to buy something from website and you go, wait a minute, we can't do that. That's too dangerous. And suddenly you say, wait, I have an enabling idea. Let's put this piece of security there. Now watch. Now subject with credit card can come in and I can invent protocols to make sure that everything is okay. Check to make sure we're good and go ahead and use the credit card. It enables the ability of subjects and objects to communicate. Isn't that a better way of thinking about it? It's really the same picture, but it's a much more reasonable way of thinking about cybersecurity in the context of business, the internet, of all the things that we do. Security is an enabler instead of as a blocker. So keep that in mind as we go through our discussions. It's a better way of thinking about cybersecurity and it'll pervade a lot of the discussions that we do. Thanks. We're going to take some time now and think about adversaries. Now, what that word means is someone that, in, in a sense, is your like opposing party, someone that may have malicious intent with respect to you. When, when two groups don't get along, they're called adversaries. When they fight, when they're opposed in some, for whatever reason, call them adversaries. And cybersecurity is all about that, right? Cybersecurity is not about you know, an earthquake or an inadvertent piece of code causing a problem. That's not cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is about malicious activity, something that's intentionally done. So we want to talk through really the four types of quote unquote actors that are involved in causing problems. Now, the first one is what we would call a hacker. Now, I believe that most hackers, young people, are mostly of benign intent. I think when people have this joy of breaking into things and learning how they work and piecing them apart and getting in. They do that for love of technology. And I think it's certainly the least concerning to me, but I think you have to be careful because hackers can get themselves in a lot of trouble when they break into things and maybe inadvertently cause a problem. But certainly along the spectrum, a hacker should be someone that's helping all of us understand the problems that exist in our system. So that's sort of the first type. The second type is criminal. <laughs> so it's a little different, right? A criminal is somebody who wants money. They're just stealing things. I mean, there's no other way to put it. When somebody's stealing your credit cards and putting them up on the dark web or something for sale, I think we all know what the motivation is there, right? It's money. And there's no two ways about it. That is malicious. And there's no question that's an adversary, right? I hope none of you are doing anything like that. If you are, don't. Law enforcement's getting real good at detecting that sort of thing and crime does not pay. So I think that second type, a criminal, is certainly more malicious. And keep in mind that this is something that as long as we've had money, we've had crime, the thing that's changed is that money is now online, right? Your credit card is something you use all the time online. And increasingly, you see Bitcoin and things being used. In fact, in some later lectures, later in our session, I'm going to take you through how blockchain works. Really kind of cool. But at any rate, criminals are the second type. Third would be politically or philosophically or even religiously motivated hacktivists. So those are groups that have some message that they're really passionate about. And I'll be honest with you, in many cases, it's a perfectly legitimate message. They're people who are outraged at injustices and they use hacking as a way of expressing their outrage. Now, now be careful, this vigilanteism is not acceptable in most societies, but it's certainly a third clear type of malicious actor that we need to be aware of. So this one's tough because, you know, sometimes like with the group Anonymous, that's a, probably the most famous group of, 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 say, philosophically motivated hackers, Sometimes they'll do things that you might be agreeing with and cheering on. Other times they might be doing things that you would absolutely not agree with under any circumstances. But it's a more unpredictable group and they certainly have motivations that are a little different. So that's the third. The fourth and most intense is the nation state actor. This is a tough one. 
This is when military groups use cyber hacking, use vulnerabilities in systems as a means for warfare, for achieving military objectives. This is a disturbing kind of situation because these are usually well-funded groups with all the resources that are available, lots of time, and generally a lot of patience. This is something that we need to be concerned with as a group. If we were all together as a learning community right here in the room, I'd make you raise your hand and promise that you're not gonna be any of the four there, that you're gonna be a defender. I mean, I think that's a much more noble pursuit, and that's what we'll be emphasizing through these entire sessions. It's more about defense. And I wanna stay on this point for a minute. Most of you think of cybersecurity as hacking, and I will tell you that it is 10 times more difficult to think through defenses than offensive hacking. If you tell me that you can sit around and fiddle around with something and break into it, you've not impressed me at all. But if you tell me that you've come up with a way to protect that system, then you have my attention. And I want that to be something that sinks in. Hacking is not cybersecurity, it's a component. There's no question that there's a place for penetration testing a system, looking for soft spots. But as we've said a couple of times now, testing is a terrible way to demonstrate the absence of a problem. Terrible way. Now, a dimension of these four malicious adversaries that we talked about is called attribution. That means, do they care about getting caught? <laughs> like, if I can attribute attacks to you, then I have this attribution property in your attack. So let's, let's take a little quiz as a group here just to test our learning with respect to the four types. Again, hacker, criminal, hacktivist, nation state. Now, for those four groups, who do you think would be the most concerned about attribution, meaning I don't wanna get caught, and who do you think might be the least concerned? Now let's take them in turn, hackers probably don't want to get caught, right? Probably pretty motivated to not get caught, but there's also the balancing argument that they're probably not trying to bring down planet Earth either. So they might be uh, high on the scale of not wanting to be caught. How about criminals? No question about it, they don't want to get caught. That's the whole idea when you're a criminal. You don't want to get caught. In fact, I'd put them as number one and not wanting to get caught. How about the hacktivists? Do they care about getting caught? Maybe not, right? If you're trying to get your point across, you may be raising your hand saying, I did it. Like that's the whole basis for terrorism, right? Terrorism, in the, for the most part, is not something that you hide from, but rather you accept full attribution for what's going on. So I'd put the hacktivists in the category of generally being less concerned about getting caught. And then nation state kind of in the middle there, right? No need to get caught, but if you do get caught, hey, what are you gonna come arrest me? If I'm a government and I'm a military and I go after another country, I may be doing it in full attribution or I may wanna do it quietly. So think about that as we go through the cybersecurity. Attribution is a much more complex topic and it's a nice way of helping us to understand the motivation and the techniques used by these different types of malicious actors. Thanks. Now, the definition of a vulnerability is a system attribute or feature that can be exploited to cause something bad to happen. <laughs> not, not exactly the most technical definition, but you get the idea. Like if there's a bug in a system or something, and I go, ah, oh my gosh, I can exploit that to cause something bad, then we call that a vulnerability. It turns out there, there are gonna be four types of vulnerabilities. So let's go through them. And it's a taxonomy, again, that we wanna keep in mind as we go through the cybersecurity. You're noticing in our lectures here, there's a lot of lists, right? I, sometimes cybersecurity reminds me of biology. You know, all these taxonomies and lists and types, and you can get a little crazy with it. I try and minimize it. I don't want you to have to be sitting around memorizing things, but I do think it, it, it helps in our vocabulary for you to be able to sort things out. So the first type of vulnerability is just flat out a bug. It's usually a bug in software, system design, a software design, and that's where you just made a mistake 
in some code. Like for example, if you write code that takes in address names in a box, name, address, and whatever, and you kind of forget to do some bounds checking in the software, duh. I assume you're smart enough to know that, but for years people didn't know that. And then somebody figures out, oh, this software doesn't even check to see. So where it says address, I just hold down the A key and let it just keep running and suddenly the whole system crashes and I'm sitting there laughing. That's a vulnerability that takes advantage of a flaw in your code. You, you blew it and I did that. And, and the question is, is that malicious or is that tampering? Well, well, you have to decide. But so that's the first type of vulnerability and that's kind of a funny example. But the reality is they're dangerous ones, right? You don't want that kind of an example like in the safety system for a nuclear power plant, that would not be a great thing if somebody can tamper with those things. So that's number one. Second is a missing security control. So that's where set up a network, set up a router, connect everybody up, hook up Wi-Fi, everything's great. We go, how are we doing? And somebody says, seems like we're getting hacked. And you go, getting hacked, getting hacked. And you went, I forgot to put a firewall in. And everybody goes, duh. And you run out, you get yourself a firewall, whether you buy it or download it, whatever, you put it in place. Missing security component. It's not really like a coding flaw. It's a little different, but you can see in both cases, it's your mistake, right? I mean, that's the essence of vulnerability. It's somebody doing something that is then exploited. You got that? So for bug, missing security flaw is the second. The third, is you and me, human action. It's our learning community doing something dumb. An email comes across and it says, hey, you have a fax waiting for you at coolcoolfax.net. And you go, coolcoolfax.net. And it says, yeah, just click here and get your fax. You go, hmm, I wasn't expecting a fax. Well, let's click and see what happens. And you click and it downloads malware, whatever. It's a human being, a human being doing something dumb. Now, that's a, a really egregious example. But I'll tell you what, think about your day to day activity. I'm pretty sure I could send you something like that. You know what that's called, called a fish. I could probably get you to click on something, right? If I sent our learning community something from me and it said, hey, what'd you think of the lecture today? With a, link you probably click on that right and and there's ways around it but again anyway, the vulnerability type the third one is human being a fourth kind of interesting one is organizational action meaning you didn't fund the security team properly you didn't put people in place you, you were negligent in setting up policy you just were a bad organizational manager and you set things up in a chaotic way now, all four of them can be exploited, right? I mean, fundamentally, it's that first one that from a functional perspective is the one that gets exploited. In all the other cases, there's ones and zeros, there's computing going on. Like if a human being does something stupid and there's a fish that causes malware to be downloaded, the malware is still taking advantage of a vulnerability in the operating system in your local runtime environment. But those four different components, that gives you a pretty good idea of how we're going to be categorizing vulnerabilities. Most of our emphasis is going to be on the first, that first software vulnerability, the bugs and so on, with some emphasis on the second one as well. So I hope that's a good way for you to kind of keep straight in your mind a useful taxonomy on vulnerabilities. Thanks. Hey, I got good news for you. Another taxonomy coming up, <laughs> a list that you have to keep track of, but pretty soon we'll be running out of lists. So hang with me. Now listen, it turns out that there are really three primary types of threats that we deal with on the internet and in computing. In a minute, I'll tell you there may be a fourth, but let's start with the first three. And threat really is something bad that can happen to an asset. An asset is the thing you care about, your computing, your network, your software, your infrastructure, your data, your customer lists, your source code, things you care about. Something bad can happen to that as a result of some sort of malicious attack. We call that a threat. Notice 
the English word threat is something that I would use with you to, as, as, a, as some way of causing you to think that some future action might happen that'll be like, I'm going to threaten you. This is a little different. Think of threat more as a technical term that just describes a set of possible conditions that can cause something bad to an asset. So let's take the first three. First one is called confidentiality. And that's where secrets are given up. There's leaks of information. If you live here in the United States, then you know we've had issues in our government with a lot of things leaking and with election-related leaking. And it can be very damaging when information that was intended to be secret is leaked. Think about a conversation you may have had with a friend. Um, you may have said some things that you don't want everyone to know about, but if I had a secret listener and I was able to capture what you said and then I push it on the internet, you're not going to like that. The property of preventing that is called privacy. So when we have privacy properties, then we worry less about confidentiality or disclosure problems. Does that make sense? So confidentiality is the first threat type. Second is called integrity, and that has to do with malicious modification, malicious altering of something. That's where I go in, and instead of reading and stealing your data, I change your system. I alter it. I break it. I infect it. I do something that affects the validity or the, the integrity of a system. A million examples of that, but obviously malware and viruses are the most common. Malware in a system is an example of an integrity threat. So that's our second one. Third one's called availability. And you might think of it also as denial of service. That's where a hacker, a malicious actor, somebody takes steps to block legitimate access to some resource. Might be a network. Like let's say your network's hooked up to a, a internet service provider pipe to a router. And the internet service provider takes you out to the internet. Your network, ISP, internet, got that? And then somebody out on the internet decides, hey, I want to make it difficult for you to connect to the internet. So what am I going to do? I'm going to make this link real busy. I'm going to just keep sending stuff to you over and over and over and over and over, and over again. Create a gigantic traffic jam on your ISP ingress or e egress pipe. And suddenly, normal users can't get in because it's too busy. Create a traffic jam. We call that a denial of service attack. So the first three, when we organize them by the first letters, confidentiality, integrity, availability, it spells CIA. And I guess, you know, in the US, it was like a little joke there that it would be like the CIA, but we call that the CIA model of cybersecurity, three types of threats. Now here's the problem. I think there's a fourth threat type. And I wrote a textbook on this 25 years ago and I put this in there, but the fourth, let me tell you, I think it's theft or fraud. And here's the idea. If I steal money, if I steal a service without paying, like let's say I get on a train and I'm riding on an empty, it's an empty train. And I might be, if I'm in the U.S., I'm taking a train from New York to Philadelphia. I get on early in the morning, I sit down, whole train's empty. The conductor comes up and says, hello, sir, do you have a ticket? And I say, I don't have a ticket. He goes, what do you mean you don't have a ticket? I said, well, I, I don't have a ticket. I, I don't have any money, but I'm going to get a job in Philadelphia. If I get a job, I'll take the train all the time. Can you let me go? What does the conductor do? Should the conductor throw you off, leave you on? You are committing fraud. You're, you're stealing service. Now, I hope you let him stay on. Seems like a nicer world if the conductor lets you stay on, but set that aside. You can see how it's not really a disclosure problem. It's not the integrity and certainly not denial of service. Nobody's on the train. So when people steal services without paying, I think it's a fourth threat type. So sometimes I say fraud is a fourth and I say CIAF model. But the CIA model is well established in computer security. Either one works, but you certainly should recognize that CIA are well-developed kind of concepts. Now let's test our thinking here a little bit. 